Things like Job 40:15 that seems to describe like a dinosaur living with humans and things like that. We show a calibration of the Genesis 11 genealogies that allows you to come up with a biblical date for the origin of humanity. Abraham, the last man in the genealogy, and we have an accurate historical date based on the biblical record as well as extra biblical historical sources that place him as living about 4,000 years ago. I also take the position that Job 40 is not addressing dinosaurs. Hugh Ross was asked if dinosaurs lived with humans, and I think this is very, very interesting, and we're gonna dive deep into it. Let's go. I don't consider myself a scientist whatsoever. I'm only a freshman in high school, but <laughs> I, I, um, you know, I just started looking around for things that, um, might help me, you know, have an argument against evolution since biology is part of my class list this year. And um, I came along a, a bunch of things, mostly um, uh, a scientist whose name is, uh, you know, left me right now, but who has a website, uh, drdino.com, who I, you might know. And um, he has some things on his website like, um, he has pictures of trees growing through uh, different layers of geometric rock that, you know, has supposedly gone over millions of years, um, growing straight up, going through those layers. Um, things like Job uh, 40, 15, um, that seems to describe like a dinosaur um, living with humans and things like that. And uh, gosh, there's one other thing. But um, and I was just wondering how you could explain those things. Um, oh, the other thing was um, how dating the, the lives and uh, like the number of years that humans lived from Adam and Eve to now that it goes back to six, about 6,000 years ago. And uh, I was just wondering how you might explain those. Okay. Uh, if you want a longer answer, uh, I actually debated Dr. Dino on national television uh, for two hours and 40 minutes. And uh, this is the product. So, <laughs> and uh, we discuss those issues and a lot of other issues as well. And uh, we make available the uncut uh, version uh, of the debate. So, um, but uh, let me see. There are three points that you made. Oh yeah, the the date uh, for humanity. Um, what you'll see in, in fact, we're bringing out a book on human origins in October. And uh, I think this is also up on our website. Uh, we show a calibration of the Genesis 11 genealogies that allows you to come up with a biblical date uh, for the origin of humanity. And uh, how it works is that uh, you've got uh, Abraham, the last man in the genealogy. And we have an accurate historical date based on the biblical record as well as extra biblical historical sources that place him as living about 4,000 years ago. Then halfway in the genealogy from Noah to Abraham, you've got a man called Peleg. And Genesis 10 tells us that the world was divided in the days of Peleg. And we believe that's a reference to the breaking of the Bering Land Bridge. There was a nice wide bridge that was connecting Siberia to Alaska that permitted humans to migrate, mm. uh, but that bridge was broken and uh, we have accurate carbon-14 dating that tells us that happened 11,000 years ago. So if Peleg was alive 11,000 years ago, and if Abraham was alive 4,000 years ago, and if the lifespans recorded in Genesis 11 are approximately proportional to the passage of time, that would put the flood of Noah in the neighborhood of, say, 25 to 35,000 years ago, and Adam and Eve in the neighborhood of uh, 50,000 years ago. And uh, Fuzz Rana will talk to you tomorrow about how we now have new scientific dating tools using genetics, mitochondrial DNA, and a Y chromosome analysis, as well as new archaeological finds that establish that the, the scientific date for the origin of humanity is about 50,000 years ago. That's interesting. So who's right? Like, imagine, I'm pretty sure the young Earth creation is, pr is a pretty new thought. Like, it hasn't been around forever like everyone likes to think it has. It wasn't in church tradition that this is how they always thought. This is how what they always believed. I don't think so. Consistent uh, picture here. 
Uh, let's see. The second point was about uh, dinosaurs and humans living together. And humans living together. Uh, I deal with this in this book, A Matter of Days, uh, about the claims that there are footprints in a Texas riverbed uh, that shows human footprints uh, crossing dinosaur footprints. And most young earth creationists, Dr. Dino is a young earth creationist. Uh, it's Kent Hoven. His nickname is Dr. Dino. Oh. Um, most young earth creationist leaders have withdrawn the claim uh, that this is evidence for humans and dinosaurs living together. I think Dr. Dino is one of the few holdouts that really claims it is evidence. So that's Kent Hoven. <laughs> I did not know that. But the question is, though, then how do people, before dinosaurs were discovered, which is in the 1800s, how were there drawings of dinosaurs before that time? I think that's a fascinating question. And the reason why most of them have withdrawn the claim is because if you look carefully at the so-called human footprints, the gait is a little, about a foot longer than a human stride. And it's about the right length for a dinosaur stride. And also you can take a brush and you can artificially, well you can actually erode some of the soft uh, dirt that's around the print. And the principle here is that if you're walking through mud and you pull your foot out of uh, fairly thick mud, you get this sucking sound and what happens is soft mud will go in to fill in your print and so the print left behind is smaller than your original foot. And so scientists have actually eroded away that softer material and they recover the original print. And it's a dinosaur print, not a human print. The other thing you notice is there's a claw mark behind the heel. As far as I know, there's never been a human being with a claw behind the heel. And probably the most compelling evidence, there's a chemical residue. And if you analyze a chemical residue, it identifies the species that left the print and in this case, it's a three-toed um, carnivorous uh, dinosaur. So uh, I take the position uh, that dinosaurs did not cohabit with human beings. I also take the position that Job 40 is not addressing uh, dinosaurs. The behemoth and the leviathan, in my opinion, are not dinosaurs. Most likely, I think they're the hippopotamus and they're the crocodile. And yet... Hmm... Do you really think so? How do hippopotamuses have tails like a cedar tree? Do you think crocodiles do? Are described in terrifying language. Uh, but what Job is doing for us is describing the emotional e effect of a man coming into close contact with this leviathan creature or this behemoth creature when you're armed with a sin single stick or a rock in your hand. And, they, and it's loaded with metaphorical language. Just count how many times True. Job 40 and 41 uses the words as and like. In one translation, I counted 21 times. So it's not telling us that this is a creature that's got plates of steel in its belly. It says it may as well have plates of steel in its belly for all the good your stick is going to do. And it may as well be breathing fire out of its mouth for all the good the rock is going to do in your hand. And I've been to Africa three times, uh, speaking and teaching there, and I ran into a biologist there that said there's two creatures in Africa that are responsible for about 95% of all human deaths. It's the hippo and the crocodile. Joe Forty tells us that the hippo is a vegetarian, but extremely territorial and very hard to see in the water. It lies there submerged in muddy water with only two nostrils above the surface. So if you're in a canoe going down the river, you will not spot the hippos until it's too late. The hippos won't eat you, but they will capsize your canoe, and the crocodiles know that's going to happen, so they just sit there waiting for lunch. Well, why not just use the word, I mean, hippo and crocodile? I mean, to be fair, maybe they had different names for these creatures, but we would have known that. And what if they had the same names? I also heard it as a metaphor for just the dangers of life or God creating all things. And there was a third point he asked. I can't remember the, the third one. The trees coming down through the... The trees? Oh yeah, the one about uh, the fact that he, uh, Kent Hoban argues we must be living on a young earth because when you go to the Cran Canyon and other places like that, you see all these sedimentary layers, but jutting through them uh, are these fossilized trees. And uh, what he tries to do is to paint the old, old earth, young earth debate as a debate between geologists who believe that it's uniformitarian process, 
where you have the layers laid down by gradual erosion type mechanisms. And then you have the young earth creationists who argue it's catastrophism. There is these, well, there's just this one dramatic catastrophe, the global flood, that makes things happen very rapidly. That's really a, a misnomer of what's going on in geology. The tr truth is, geologists believe in both uniformitarian uh, processes and catastrophic processes. And it's not just one flood, it's hundreds of floods, hundreds of disasters, like these asteroid collisions. And when these disasters hit, what it does is it causes things like trees to be blasted through several sedimentary layers. Uh, you know, you guys live in uh, tornado country. And if you get a real good tornado coming through an Illinois cornfield, what that tornado can do is uh, cause a corn stalk to be blown up from the ground and it can drive it through a tree that's 50 years old such that the corn stalk is not damaged at all. It actually goes right through the tree. We see that routinely wow. with tornadoes. Well, that's a good example of what I'm talking about. The growth of the tree is gradual. Year by year, it forms a ring. And then the tornado uh, puts this uh, corn stalk right through 100 uh, layers uh, of the tree. We see the same thing in the Grand Canyon. And you look at all the evidence, it's evidence for an old earth, uh, not a young earth. But hey, if you want to look at the bait, it's here. And if you want to look at something that's much more scholarly, this is a written debate uh, where three positions are presented. The framework hypothesis, uh, the day-age position that I defend, and uh, then the 24-hour position. So don't take my word for it. Uh, read the debate books, look at the debate video, and make up your That's interesting. Yeah, I think the important thing is, is this is not a first degree issue when it comes to our faith in Christ. Because so many people, like if they find out that you don't believe in a young earth creation or something like that, they literally will cry in like fear for your salvation. They're like, are you even a Christian anymore? And that's just not the case. Maybe there's just other studies based off of reading the Bible you understand that maybe that's not how it could have been. Can God do anything? Yes, he can. Let's look up when did the young earth creationists begin? Yeah, this is what I thought. Young earth creationist YEC beliefs are primarily a modern development formalized in the mid 20th century by Henry Morris and others emerging in response to specific response to scientific theories like evolution and geology that challenged a literal interpretation of the Genesis creation account while the idea of recent miraculous creations creation has roots in early Christian thought, the specific YEC movement and its pseudoscientific arguments began in the 1960s, promoting the belief of the earth is no more than 10,000 years old and the six-day creation of the literal 24-hour period. Yeah, to call it pseudoscience is crazy too. But Anyway, I'd love to know what you guys think. The most important thing, like I said, is having a relationship with Jesus. If you've never decided to do that, I encourage you to do that today. In the description below, you can click a link to help you to follow Jesus for the first time. I encourage you to do that today. I also remember, guys, Jesus loves you.